Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for another session of EI Live K-12, brought to you by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. My name is Cassie, and I'm the Director for the Office of Education and Outreach, and a big part of my job is bringing our scientific research to different audiences, including K-12 students and educators. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind sustainability and the climate crisis, and what we as global citizens can do. Experts that make up the Earth Institute include earth scientists, business and policy experts, economists, and specialists in public health and law. The Earth Institute is actually made up of more than two dozen research centers and several hundred people who work across many different disciplines and uh, schools at Columbia University. What we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to our interdisciplinary work through our experts. We will have sessions until the end of June for students and educators, and you can find all of the content that we've done so far and all of the videos plus additional readings and resources on the EI Live K-12 website. If you'd like to know what that site is, please just email me and I'll share a link, with, uh, I'll share a link to it in the chat box. So today we're going to hear from Laurel Zyma and Margie Turin. They both work at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is one of Earth Institute's research centers. Um, Laurel is an education program assistant, and Margie is a director of, uh, of educational field partnerships. Oh my gosh, Margie, I forgot what your title was. Um, some of those, director of field partnerships, I believe. <laughs> um, so they're going to be taking us on an adventure to explore the Hudson River estuary, uh, which spans 153 miles from the Troy Dam down to the tip of Battery uh, Park in New York City. So as a reminder, the chat box should be used to ask questions um, or to answer the presenters' questions. So Margie and Laurel will be asking some questions throughout their presentation and we'll uh, look to the chat box for some of your answers. And so we encourage you to participate. Once the session is done, we will share a link with everyone registered for this event so that you can access the recording later on. We do make the video private for a few days while we edit it. And uh, what we'll do is send you a recording when it's posted and available publicly on YouTube. Uh, also feel free to get in touch with me if you are having any technical difficulties. So without further ado, here's uh, Laurel and Margie. Great, thank you very much. So um, rather than spend a few minutes introducing ourselves right off the bat, we thought we would start by just focusing on what we're gonna be talking about today. And that's the beautiful image that you see in front of you. So I thought we would take a second and just kind of walk through it. Um, we are looking north on the Hudson in this image. And you'll see in the bottom of the image, there's a bridge that bridges the Bear Mountain Bridge. And um, just behind it, you'll see something that looks like a lawn. Uh, that is not a lawn, that's a marsh. One of the many marshes that are part of our Hudson. Uh, marshes are critically important for us in the Hudson. They are a place where young of the year fish spend a lot of their early time. Um, and this particular marsh is a really important habitat for small striped bass, which is a, a really important fish for us on the Hudson. Um, you also see some amazing hills in front of you, and those are the Hudson Highlands. They're part of the Appalachian Trail, actually, so you can walk through them. Um, and a really wonderful setting for our exploration today. Uh, Laurel and I spend a tremendous amount of time talking about, thinking about, working on the Hudson River. Um, it's a place where we love to take uh, students and uh, run some of our education programs. And we have one program that we um, really love to do, and that's called the Day in the Life of the Hudson and Harbor, which we do in cooperation with uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And actually, data that we're working with today was collected by students, just like yourselves, um, as part of that program. So, so that you can do this investigation with us and spend time with us uh, efficiently today, we thought we'd start by asking you to get a pen or, or pencil and a piece of paper. We're gonna be collecting some data as we travel along the river. And those will be um, important pieces for you to be able to collect the information so that you can help us in that investigation. And I think we're ready to move on and introduce ourselves. Great, so Laurel, do you wanna start? 
Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurel Zyma. As Cassie said, I work at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory as the uh, education program assistant. Uh, my background is actually marine biology. So I love teaching about the Hudson. It's going to be such a blast teaching you guys all about um, the different biology that lives in the Hudson. So make sure you guys grab that pen and paper so you can join us on this investigation. Terrific. And my name is Margie Turin. And um, my job is uh, Director of Educational Field Programs at Lamont Doherty. Um, love the Hudson River, love working with Laurel on the Hudson River. And we, and we, it's, I don't think there's anything we enjoy more than just taking students down and, and spending some time. So let's do it. Okay, so we've talked about the Hudson and that's what we call our water address. But what we thought we would do is just get you guys to think a little bit about what your water address is. Everywhere in the world has a water address. Each one of us has one. So if you want to put in the chat where you are and what's the closest water body to you, there are lots of different water bodies, there are oceans, there are lakes, there are rivers, estuaries. We're going to explore some of those today, but for right now, let's just get your uh, location and your water body in the chat box so we can get a sense of where all our water addresses are. And while we're thinking about that, um, we can look at this amazing image of the world and you can see by that how much water there is. So the world is made up of almost, well, it's almost three quarters water. 71% is our oceans and our waterways. So really an incredible place. It's hard not to have a water address, right? Okay, do we have any answers, Cassie? Yes, we do. So we have uh, we have a lot of New Yorkers here today. So um, the Hudson River, um, the Brooklyn Bay, um, Hudson River again, the Gowanus Canal, um, Hudson River one more time. So great, we have a lot of fans of the of uh, or and a lot of people who live near the um, near the Hudson. So West Point, New York, um, Harrisburg, um, Spark Hill. Um, so Spark Hill Creek, uh, Park Slope in, um, in Brooklyn, Charles River in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Wow. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's a great, uh, great responses, everybody. Thank you. That's amazing. And all of those places sound super familiar and fun. So um, even the Charles River, I've been there. So that's amazing. Thank you all for doing that. We're going to go to the next slide and look at um, this map. So we like to think about water addresses in terms of watersheds so i'm hoping that you guys all can put down on your paper what a definition of a watershed is and we'll think about that as we walk through this map so this is a map of the u.s divided into watersheds and sub watersheds you could take the entire u.s and divide it in two and there are two main watersheds that kind of run along the back of the pink and yellow outlines that are on the map and those are the rocky mountains that's what we call the big continental divide but you can break these things down much much smaller each one of these um, sections looks a lot like a body doesn't it with veins and arteries and that's in fact because they are somewhat like veins and arteries, the water that runs through them is really bringing nutrients and life to all different parts of the earth. Um, it's where it's home to a variety of our different species, including fish and turtles and any number of smaller critters. Um, so they're very, very important. Watersheds, if you have written this down, hopefully you can confirm, they are defined by high areas, they're drainage areas. So, um, areas where the water collects and runs into a main water source. So that big pink area in the middle of the United States is actually a combination of the Missouri and Mississippi River. That's the Mississippi watershed. And now we're going to pop up where we are. Not as big as that. It's this wonderful watershed that's way over on the right. And that's the Hudson River watershed. So it's every bit as important as the Mississippi to all of us, right? Okay, and we're going to go to the next slide. Um, and so this is just taking a zoom in on our watershed. Um, and at the top of the map, you'll see in black and red, that's an outline of New York State. And you can see how much the Hudson River watershed actually takes up in New York State. 
but believe it or not, it's contributed from other states. So New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Vermont, uh, Connecticut, to name a few, all contribute into this watershed. So it's, it's quite an important place. And then you'll see the Hudson running straight down the middle. So from top to bottom, that's the Hudson. You'll see that there's a uh, kind of an arm that goes off to the, to the left or the west. That's the Mohawk River, which is just one of the big tributaries into the Hudson. There are many, many, many smaller rivers and creeks and streams that feed into the Hudson. Every single one of those is where the Hudson really starts. Um, so a really important part. Um, to look at where we are, we're going to have, yep, we have Laurel click that. Great. And you'll see that it ends up in this kind of, um, oh, it's kind of an oval shape in the river. This is actually the widest part of the Hudson River. There are two bays that meet. There's a Tappan Z, Z standing for C, and Haverstraw Bay, and they form this nice wide fat uh, part of the river. It's the widest one, uh, part of the Hudson. It's about three miles or five kilometers wide at its widest. And it's also fairly shallow. So it's a wonderfully rich area of the river. In fact, it is considered the most critical habitat on all of the Hudson. And more than that, it's really critical habitat for the whole Atlantic seaboard. So out of the Hudson and all along the coast. So a really important part of our watershed. And we're gonna let Laurel take us on a tour now. Um, outside and around to where our field station is. All right, so we would love to have you guys come visit our field station um, once things start opening back up. But in the meantime, I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of the field station um, through Google Earth. So this is the United States. We are zooming right on into New York um, for, in a beautiful place called Piermont Pier. Um, this amazing pier has a long history in Rockland County and with Lamont. Um, we used to have our research vessel um, docked right off the edge of this pier. This building right here, that's our field station. Um, that's where we have a lot of educational programming. We have this beautiful edge of the pier where a lot of fisher people come um, to go fishing for uh, striped bass and blue crab. This is the area where we sane. So this is where we take students and teachers and the public to go fishing. So it's that nice shallow area right off of the pier. And as you can see, the pier is extremely long. It's about one mile long, extending almost halfway through that wide section of the Hudson that Margie was talking about. I just wanted to show you guys the proximity to the Tappan Zee Bridge. So that is the bridge that connects Rockland County to Westchester County. Um, and right here we have the Piermont Marsh which is the largest tidal saltwater marsh on the Hudson. So it is this amazing, rich ecosystem, and it absolutely has an influence on the water uh, quality that comes right, that we sample right off the edge of Piermont Pier because we're so close to that marsh. And that is where we work when we're not at the field station. So this is Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, and so we are very close. Um, and if you guys look, we are extremely close to New York City as well, only about 30 miles away. Um, so that's Times Square just for reference. And if we zoom out even farther, you can see that Piermont is also really close right to the harbor there that meets the Atlantic Ocean. So we are in that lower mid Hudson region um, of the Hudson. That's a little tour for you guys. And for a zoom up of our field station, um, this is an amazing place for you guys to learn all about the Hudson River and about some of the research that we do at Lamont. So I encourage you guys all to come visit us um, when we have an opportunity to. You guys can see on the left side of the building, there are some um, murals that were created by a local artist in Piermont. He was able to do a timeline going back from the prehistoric times in the Rockland County area, what it looked like way back in the past, all the way to more recent human history. So both of these murals um, tell a great story about our area in Piermont. And on the right side, outside of our building, you can see that there's this monitor here. And um, we have live 
water conditions data being live streamed right on that monitor. So anyone that comes by for um, fishing or other recreational purposes, they can check out the um, water of, the, of that specific time period. So they can look at tides, they can look at temperature. Um, there's a bunch of other parameters that we project there. So we just want everyone to be um, able to, even if our, we're locked up for the time being, we want everyone to be able to educate themselves on their own. Inside the building, we have microscopes, we have this beautiful topographic map, um, and we also have equipment to go um, and do field investigations. So hopefully you guys have a chance to come visit us there. All right, but today we're gonna to be doing our investigation virtually. And some people call the Hudson a river, some people call it an estuary. So we are going to focus our investigation on figuring out which one it is. Um, and like Margie said, we're going to be using data from the day in the life of the Hudson program that is collected by students just like you. So we're going to be using that data to kind of figure out is a river or isn't an estuary. First, I want you guys to tell me in the chat what you think a river is and what you think an estuary is. And I'm going to uh, collect all of that data on a whiteboard here. So go ahead, start writing in the chat. I want to hear what you guys um, think. And we're going to collect all of that data. All right. Can you guys see that whiteboard? Yep, we can. Perfect. Great. Uh, so while we're waiting for answers to come in, um, we we had a question about um, whether or not um, the presenters and we've whether or not we've heard of the Billion Oyster pro program, um, and I had indicated in the chat box that we have, um, but perhaps Margie and Laurel, if you want to um, talk a little bit about if, if you guys have worked with them. I know that, um, you know, we have a colleague uh, who does, um, and if you've worked with them in any way, or if you've done anything with oysters at the field station. That's a really great question. Yeah, so the Billion Oyster Project, they are um, close partners of ours. We have um, partnership programs that are being run down in New York City at the um, uh, Hudson River Park, where high school students that are mentored by college students, they actually um, have a whole summer research program where they are measuring and gathering data about these oysters. Um, so that was kind of our first time um, going out with the Billion Oyster Project. And we found recently that there were wild oysters living right off of Piermont Pier. And so we, um, reached out to Billion Oyster Project and we are excited to hopefully in the near future install some of our own oyster monitor in cages right off of Piermont Pier. So if you're local and that's something that you guys would be interested in participating in, um, it's a community science project for people of all ages and we would love to have you come out and help us um, monitor the growth of these oysters right off of our field station. Great, thank you. So we have some answers uh, coming in. So Laurel, I'll just read okay. everything out uh, to you and uh, you can write, write those down. If you want me to repeat anything, just let me know. So we have going back to the, the first answer here. So I think a river is water. Depends on where you are uh, in the length of the river. Estuary is the uh, tidal mouth of a large river where the tide meets the stream. Um, I think a river is a long string of water, but an estuary is a body of water. Um, a freshwater river turns into a salty estuary when it nears uh, the ocean, and an estuary is tidal. Um, the, a river brings fresh water down to the ocean, and an estuary brings salt water in from the ocean. Um, an estuary flows two ways. Uh, river equals fresh water, estuary equals salt and fresh water mix, uh, estuary salt and fresh water, um, and river is salt water. And then we also have a question um, about where the Hudson changes from an estuary to a river. Oh, that is a great question. I'm not going to answer it quite yet because that's going to okay. be a part of our investigation, but you guys are, I love the, the wheels are turning there. Um, there was so many answers. I tried to gather as much as I could. Great job, everyone. Um, I have a 
quick follow up and maybe um, you guys can just think about it as we go through the investigation. Um, someone said that the estuary is a mix of salt and fresh water. Um, does anyone know what the term for that is? A mix of salty and fresh water. You don't have to throw it in the chat. You can if you want to, but just think about that as we go through um, the investigation. Great job. I'm going to save our beautiful data and all right. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, that was wonderful. It's a great start to our investigation. We're going to move into geography. The Hudson geography. And again, we're going to be investigating today um, whether the Hudson is a river or an estuary. So we have our investigative tool, we have our magnifying glass, we might need more than that. We'll introduce you to some other tools in just a moment, but maybe Laura, you could give us a click and we'll um, move our map into a different orientation and spend a little bit of time with it. So um, you can see down by New York City, to the left of New York City right now is going to be the ocean. So that's where the Atlantic Ocean meets our Hudson. And then as you move to the right, you'll see a couple of, of names of different cities. You'll see Poughkeepsie, which is um, up about 70 miles up the river. And then you'll see Albany. And that's actually the end of the section that we're going to be focusing on heavily today. That's our big investigative chunk. But you can see that the Hudson goes up beyond that. And in our earlier watershed map, you might remember that it goes all the way up to the Adirondacks. It goes up to the highest point. Um, but we're going to focus in on, as I said, this section from Albany to New York. The whole piece, if you started at the very bottom and went all the way up to the Adirondacks, it's over 300 miles. We're actually going to just do the bottom half of that, which is about 153 miles up at Albany. And um, over the years, diff uh, different groups have actually uh, labeled different parts of the river by river mile. And so that starts right at the tip of the battery and goes up the river. And usually they do them in every five miles, but we've got it down to where we have river miles down to almost every mile. So if you hear us use the term river mile, it starts down at the tip of the battery in New York City and moves up the river towards Albany. Okay, we're ready to move to the next slide. So we asked you to jot down some ideas and help us think about what's the difference between an estuary and a river. And we thought we would just start by uh, some principles and concepts that people have put together that separate out estuaries from rivers. And we'll just run through these. Um, and during the course of our work today, we're gonna have you think about them. You don't have to write these down. You don't have to remember them. We'll keep popping them up. But just to kind of start so we're all in the same place. Estuaries, as many of you mentioned, they directly connect the ocean to um, freshwater uh, rivers or streams. So they're both salty and fresh, whereas rivers are fresh. They bring fresh water. Estuaries, and I, somebody did mention this, they can flow two ways because of the tides. So the ocean brings tides in and you have high and low tides. So the river can go both directions. Uh, excuse me, the estuary can go both directions. Rivers actually go from high to low. So they're only going one way. Um, estuary depths vary by the tide. So at high tide, they'd be deeper and at low tide, they'd be more shallow. Whereas the river is dictated by how much water volume is just in the river flowing. So it might get higher when there's a big rain event, but normally it's just gonna be fairly consistent. Um, estuaries are very dynamic because of the ocean and because of those tidal movements whereas our rivers tend to be much more consistent. Uh, estuaries are very complex. They have a variety of different habitats, whereas rivers are less complex. Um, they have fewer differences in their habitats. And in our estuaries, we have species that can deal with fresh, uh, salty, and then this word that Laurel hinted at a minute ago, where you have a mix of fresh and salt and you get what's called brackish. Some people call it estuarine because it's what an estuary is, but so you can have fresh, salty, and brackish. And in a river, you get the freshwater species. And for both of them, 
we rely on them for everything that they do. So neither one is better or worse than the other. They're both critically important. We're just trying to figure out what the Hudson is. So let's move on. Okay, so this is a look at the um, kind of midsection of the Hudson. Um, you see right in the middle of it, it looks like a crane. Um, in fact, several different cranes. So you can see it kind of looks like a working waterfront, a kind of industrial section. And that's an interesting thing to pay attention to. And we're gonna take a, a flyover in this section of the uh, Hudson. This is a film that was done by a group of students as part of Day in the Life of the Hudson and Harbor. Um, they are Mayo Pack High School students. And you can just look, you'll see the beautiful Hudson Highlands. And if you look right there, you'll see that scar along the face of the mountain there. That's a quarry. So again, a uh, use of the uh, materials along this section of the Hudson. So just looking at it, it's pretty hard to tell if it's a river or an estuary. But we wanted you to get a sense because it's not as if you can just look at it and tell from the surface. Okay, we're ready to move on. All right, so in this next slide, we're ready to start our investigation and we're going to use some different tools to do that. Um, you'll see the arrow in this picture is pointing to a net that's called a seine net. I bet a lot of you have had an opportunity to experience a seine net since it sounds as if a lot of you are familiar with the Hudson. Um, and we'll have a video where we show it in just a second. But I wanted to just point out, it's a, a net that you scoop through the water and the fish stay in front of it. So that you're, you're kind of herding them into an area and then you can take them out once your hands are wet, put them in a bucket and you can spend some time identifying them. We often have a bubbler in there to give them a little oxygen so they stay happy and healthy. And you'll see that everybody seems to be wearing these uh, kind of interesting waders. And that's just because it keeps us warm and dry when we're out in the a river, but we could be wearing any number of things. In the summer, we often just wear boots. Um, again, that's just a fun part of our gear. And the data that we're working with today is not all collected from saints. Uh, other groups that, that are on the Hudson will use traps, they'll use rod and reel. So there are a variety of ways of collecting the information that we're gonna work with next. Okay, we're gonna take a look at a seine. So this is again, taken by those wonderful students at Mayo Pack High School, and they used a drone to fly over and collect this image of these two students. You can see the bottom's muddy. Can you see the mud swirling off from underneath the feet as the student moves that net through the water? You can also see that the, it's not easy. The water pushes against the net. So you're moving through the water and the fish will be nosing right up into that net. So, and you can see on the top, there are little floats that keep the top up and on the bottom, there are weights that keep it down. So it's wide open in the water column and the fish are right in front of it. Then this person that's out further in the middle of the, right, thank you, in the middle of the Hudson is gonna scoop around and we'll form like a little horseshoe and we'll bring that net in and empty it out. So that is um, how we say. And Laurel's gonna take us to the next bit. All right, in our second tool, so once we have all these fish, um, we need to identify them. So we have an understanding of what lives in our section of the Hudson. And the way that we do it um, is through a dichotomous key. Uh, this might be something that's familiar to some of you and it might be a new concept, but it's basically um, a really easy tool to use where you look at different features of the fish. So different parts of their external anatomy and identify whether they have that feature which would be choice A, or whether they don't, which could be choice B. You kind of go through each, fe uh, each feature, A or B, until you figure out what species that you have or what general group of fish that you have. Sometimes it doesn't get that specific to species level. Um, but there are a lot of different features of the fish that are um, differing from species to species. Just a few that I wanted to point out um, that we are going to be talking about today is first we have this pelvic fin. So that is going to be on the ventral side or the bottom side of the fish, kind of like where their belly is. It is um, in front of that longer anal fin. So that is something to keep in mind. We also are gonna be looking at the dorsal fin. So right on the opposite, instead of being on the belly, it's gonna be right on its back, a dorsal fin. I'm sure you guys have seen um, 
or heard of fish with like the dorsal fin like a shark. Um, so sometimes fish have spines and rays. Sometimes they have rays. We're going to be looking at that. We're also gonna be looking at the caudal fin, which is the tail of the fish. And these are, come in a variety of different shapes and sizes that help them to move in the water. We're also gonna be looking at the mouth shape and the eyes. So keep these in mind as we're going through identifying our fish species. And this is the fish we're gonna be identifying. So um, this is a fish that we catch in the Hudson. Um, once we catch it, we put it in a viewing glass, which is how we're looking at this guy right now. Um, if we don't have a viewing glass, sometimes we use Ziploc bags that are see-through. That works just as, um, just as well. So now we are going to use that dichotomous key um, to identify our fish. All right, so we are using the, so we have the dichotomous key in a waterproof book version, but we, there is also an online version, which is an um, amazing tool. So we have our fish here. We're going to start identification. First, we need to look at the eyes. So does this fish have eyes on the same side of the head or does it have eyes on the opposite side of the head? And while we can't see um, the other eye, we can assume that eyes are on the opposite side of the head. So if we can see one eye on the left, we're assuming that the other is on the right side. So we're gonna say B on this one. Pretty easy, right? The kind of is key, they're great. Now we're gonna look at the mouth. Remember I talked about fish have different types of mouths. So does this guy have a tiny tube-like mouth, kind of like a seahorse? Or does he have your kind of standard um, fishy mouth with no bony rings? And if you look at this guy, very clearly your standard kind of fishy mouth, not that tube-like mouth. Those are pretty unique. Okay, now um, we're looking at the pelvic fin and this is a little bit tricky. So use your detective eyes with me. The pelvic fin is on the bottom. Remember, this is that long anal fin and you can see on our fish, that's its anal fin. Do you see the pelvic fin um, at the bottom or do you not see it? It's a little tricky because it's very um, transparent. So if you look ever so slightly, there's just like a hint of it right there. So you might have to trust me on this one, but the pelvic fins are present. Okay, now I need your guys' help. So feel free to write in the chat. Um, we're looking at something called barbells. Kind of looks like whiskers. Catfish are notorious for having barbells. So do you think that this fish right here, does it have barbells or are the barbells absent? Go ahead, write in the chat. Let me know what you guys think. Um, and I can tell you the reason why some fish have barbells, it's an indicator of where they eat. So barbells are an additional sensory organ for these fish to be able to use them to feel in the sand or the mud looking for food that they can gobble up off the bottom of the floors of the river estuary ocean wherever this fish lives off of the the floor so um if there is a fish that has barbells typically it means that they are bottom feeders all right cassie do we have any answers we do. We have, so we have a few. It looks like most people are going with B. Um, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> no, and, and no barbell. That is the consensus. <laughs> no barbells. You are absolutely correct. So we are going to proceed. And since we just said there were no barbells, there isn't even one little barbell on his chin, chin, chin. We're just going to say no barbells at all. Okay, now I need you guys to help me with this one. We're talking about the dorsal fins. So remember, it's that fin on the back. Does this fish have one soft ray dorsal fin? Or do you see spines and rays on this dorsal fin of our fish? Go ahead, write it in the chat. Let me know what you think. Um, different fish have different types of dorsals. Um, these spines are really helpful for protection. So if a fish is feeling threatened, They'll throw their uh, spines up and it will kind of prevent a predator from coming down. If they were to bite it full force, they would get a bunch of spines in their mouth. So it's just a form of protection for some species of fish. Okay, the answers are coming in and the consensus is that it's A. A, correct, good job. So they have only one single dorsal with soft rays. All right. Um, this one is pretty easy. Does this fish have a long snout, kind of like a duck bill, or is it um, not long, 
so not like a duck. And we, I think we can all agree that it is not long like a duck. So we're gonna click on that one. Okay, help me out. This is, I think the last one. Does our fish have a squared off tail or is it more distinctly forked? So look at that caudal fin, that tail fin, and let me know in the chat, do you find that the tail is more squared or forked? And so that actually helps with um, how the fish moves. So the more rounded the tail is, the better maneuverability it has. So it's used for quick speeds, um, really agile in the water. The more forked it is, or the more moon shaped it is, they are much better at long distance migrations. So think of like a sailfish. They have like a really long crescent forked tail. Um, so it just helps them move depending on how they live in the water. All right, hopefully we have some answers in. We do, and it looks like A is the answer. Hey, good job, guys. So we're going to click on A. Hooray, we have our killifish. So we correctly identified our fish right here. Um, however, the Clearwater Fish Key um, identifies three different species of killifish in the Hudson. We have our mummy chug. So it's this picture of a fish right here pretty plump down the middle. We have our banded killifish, a little bit more slender with a longer tip face. And then we have our striped killifish. And these guys um, differ in coloration from male to female. So we have identified that this is a killifish. However, since there's these three different species, we're gonna have to take a little bit of a deeper dive to figure out which species we have here. And one thing I want you guys to notice is that these killifish, they all have the same genus name. Fundalis, so that means that they are so closely related that they share that genus um, name. So you can think of them kind of like cousins. They're all very closely related. Hopefully you guys can still see that fish. All right. Terrific, thank you very much. So now we're gonna take a deeper dive into these three different types of killi in the Hudson. Um, because they're each different, but they're also alike. So we're gonna start with the top picture, and that top picture is a banded killifish. And um, all of our killifish are what we call sexually dimorphic, which means the males and females look a little bit different. So we're gonna kind of walk through that right now. So for our banded, the male is on the left, and you can see he has this beautiful kind of silver banding that goes down his body. Right, thank you. And then if we go just slide straight across to the bottom on the right, that's the female. So the female has, instead of those silver bands, has these darker bands. Right above is another banded killifish. And I want you guys to write down on your piece of paper, whether that's a male or a female. And we'll come back to that in just a minute after we introduce ourselves to the other killies on the page. Okay, so if we go straight down from the banded, we have what's called a striped killifish. And these two look much different between the male and female. So on the bottom with the bands that are vertical, you'll see the male uh, striped killi. And on the top, you'll see the female and you'll see that those bands run horizontally down the body. So again, those are very different looking um, between male and female. And then if we moved, thank you, right across to the left, you see our mama chug. And our mama chug, the males are a little bit more uh, bright and dynamic in their coloring. They have, again, these kind of silver striping on the sides and darker bands in between them. And the female mummy chugs are just a little bit more olive colored, a little bit duskier. Um, in fact, often we find that our male fish are going to be a little bit more showy than our female fish, and our female fish tend to be just a little bit larger than our male fish, so it's kind of an interesting um, concept that we can think about. Okay, we're going to go back up to our bandit, and um, I want you guys to say out loud, I know I can't hear you, but we'll all say it together, that is a male. So the silver banding is there. The thing that's a little trickier about this one is that it is a little darker colored in between those silver bands. So sometimes that throws people, but it's that silver that's really what we're focusing on. Okay, we're going to shift and have Laurel tell us about how these things are alike. 
Okay, so Margie just showed us that these three species, if you really look close, there are some differences. But remember, they are alike. So we um, are going to look at right here on this food web of the Hudson. We are looking at these killies and mummies right, right there. Perfect. So they lump them all together. They lump the stripe, the bandit, and the mummy chugs all together in the food web. I want you guys um, to tell me or to actually write on your piece of paper all of the similarities that you see that these uh, killifish have just from this picture. So to zoom in, think about their placement in the food web. Think about uh, the background that is showing um, here in this beautiful landscape photo. Think about the coloration. If you can look really close, look at the different colors of these fish. Write down everything that you see are the same between the three killifish. I can give you a couple minutes for that. Great. While we wait for some answers, um, there was a question a while back where we were asking, uh, where you two were asking about the differences between a river and an estuary. Um, there was a question about where does the Hudson change from being an estuary to being a river? That's a good question. I think we're going to have to continue in our investigation to find out the answer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you guys are really eager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they all have the stripes is one of the answers coming in about the, the similarities between the killifish in the chat here. Perfect. They um, all have some type of striping. Uh, they all look green. This is another answer. <laughs> Makes sense. If you think about the Hudson and what color the Hudson is. Yeah. Oh, right. And that, that's Perfect. it so far, Laurel. Totally fine. If you guys have these written down, um, follow along with me and let's see how many of them you got. So from me, for, for myself looking at this and um, just from talking to Margie and, and thinking about this, the place on the food web is all the same for these three, uh, these three killifish. So if you look, they are a pretty small fish. Uh, they serve as a food source for a lot of um, larger predators in the Hudson. So the snap, snapping turtle could munch on these fish. Um, larger fish, birds, they all like to eat these killies. And if you guys like could tell in the picture, they're pretty close to shore. And that is typical of a killie. They really don't want to venture out much farther than 100 feet. And that's because the water, that nice shallow water, that quiet water, that's something that killies really look for in a habitat. Counter shading. So this is a feature I'm sure you've seen on fish, um, but you might not have known the name of it. When you see a fish that has a lighter, ventral or belly side, just like in this picture, you can see that these killies have that light belly and a darker top or a darker dorsal, that's called counter shading. And the purpose for that is camouflage. So if there was a animal underneath the fish, they could see that bright light color is blending in with that bright white surface of the water from the sun coming down. So it kind of blends in with the surface. But if you're a predator, let's say, on top of the fish, they're dark, um, top or their dark dorsal blends in with the bottom of the river. So it's a great form of camouflage. A lot of fish species have this counter shading. And you guys mentioned stripes, which is a form of disruptive camouflage. That surprisingly, I know sometimes people think those stripes, they're so obvious and bright and beautiful. It looks like um, that it's going to show them off, but it actually uh, blends them in with the water. Uh, sometimes those sparkly stripes kind of blend in with the reflectivity of the surface of the water and it makes it really hard for a predator if they have all these lines it's hard for them to tell where the fish starts and stops um, so it is a form of camouflage uh, the mouth and the eye positioning is all very similar for these fish so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that but all their mouths kind of aim upward so their jaws kind of aim up which might mean they eat from the surface and their eyes are all set pretty wide on their heads. And Margie just mentioned that there are distinctive uh, coloration differences between the male and the female that make it um, a little bit easier to identify the differences, um, especially during mating season, they just pop. 
and they're all native to the Hudson. So those are the similarities between these guys. Good job. Okay, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences because they are somewhat different. So we'll start with our banded killifish. So our banded is actually the slenderest of the killies. It's a very um, thin tapered looking fish. Um, and if you look at the tail, the tail is actually squared off at the back. Um, as Laurel just mentioned, their um, head is somewhat flattened and their mouths kind of tip up towards the surface and that helps them with feeding um, right up close to the surface of the water. They have eggs that have these little threads that um, attach to plants when they lay their eggs. And then the one thing that um, all of our killies are a little bit different, but they're all the same, and that they get these amazing colors during the mating season. And for the banded, the color that they pick is blue. So they get this wonderful blue patch near their anal fin and then their bellies turn bright blue. So they really stand out. So I wanna call your attention to the fact that they are small, two to four inches, um, and they live only about two to three years. And what I want you to do is write down on your piece of paper, if they're two to four inches, how many centimeters is that? Because as scientists, we tend to use metric system, not necessarily inches. We're gonna go with centimeters. So if you write that down, and Laurel can pop up for us what it is. Yeah, so hopefully you have between five and 10 centimeters. So they're fairly small. Okay, and we'll go to our next. And our next is the striped killifish. So the striped killifish, as we mentioned, has this um, very different uh, coloring on, excuse me, uh, markings on its side. Its head is rounded, so it's not quite as pointy as a banded, and it's not as narrow as a banded. Its, its body is a little bit more rounded, but not quite as round as a momichug. The corners of its tail are a little bit more rounded. I don't know if you can see that in the net, but it's not quite as squared off at the back. These guys can deal with a sandy um, environment, so a lot of the others are more interested in the mud. These guys like the sandiness. And their colors are more oranges and yellows. So they get this orange color on their sides and this bright um, yellow on their fins. So they're really quite pretty. And you'll notice the size on these is quite a bit larger. So this is six to eight inches rather than that two to three of the banded. And they live a little bit longer, three to five years. Um, so again, if you wanna take your paper and write down how many centimeters would six to eight inches be? and we'll have Laurel pop that up. Yeah, so 15 to 20 centimeters. So these are a larger fish, still small, but larger than our banded. And now we'll move on to our last, which is our mummachug. So this is a, a beautiful fish, as we said, and the name mummachug is a little distinctive, so I'll tell you what it means. It means going in crowds. It was named by our first Native American settlers here because they tend to hang together in larger groups. They actually are great to be out in the wilderness with because they eat mosquitoes, so you don't get eaten. They can eat up to 2,000 larvae a day, which is incredible. And I mentioned that they were kind of a rounder fish. I think they're shaped kind of like a cigar or a torpedo. They're really kind of plump looking. And again, they have that rounded tail. Um, a lot of people call them mud minnows because they really like to burrow in the mud or the sediment so they can actually dig right down into it. So they're on the bottom of the, um, the river or estuary or whatever we're going to be naming this. Um, and their colors are incredible. So they get these beautiful yellow pectorals and then these blue and orange markings. And you can see on the top, this is the males, by the way, I'm sorry, just the males get these wonderful colors. Sorry, ladies. Um, and you'll see on their dorsal fin, they get what looks like almost a bullseye that shows up. It's, it's a really beautiful coloring. Um, they're a very tolerant uh, fish. They actually can be uh, wrapped in, in weeds, seaweeds, and shipped around, believe it or not. They're that tolerant of oxygen. And they're so tolerant, they were picked to go up into space. So they actually sent mummichugs as well as some eggs of mummichugs just to see how they do in space. And they did just fine, by the way. 
So these guys are in between size wise, the banded and the striped. They're about five to six inches long. They live up to three years. And let's go ahead and have you put down how many centimeters that is. And we'll pop that up. Yep, 13 to 15 centimeters. So none of these are huge. They're, they're small little fish, but are, they range from banded to momichug to striped. Okay, so we'll go to our next slide. And in our next slide, what I want you to do is write down in the chat, it, which one of these is the male, the one in the back or the one in the front? And we've talked about this quite a bit, so hopefully you already are pretty, um, in touch with the fact that the males are the ones that are very different looking. So Cassie, what do we got? Um, I'm going to let, let uh, give people a quick opportunity to, okay. to write some thoughts. So we do that. The question came up um, about um, the killifish when you were talking about um, them. So the, the question was, do killifish live in ponds too? Ah, there are different varieties that can live in a variety and different uh, water bodies. So yes, there are some that can, but these three are the ones that we're talking about today. Yeah, there are quite a few different types of killifish. It's a great question. Okay, great. Um, so most of the all the answers coming in so far say that the back is the male mamachog in this in this image. You're absolutely right. So the back is the one that has that wonderful yellow coloration on his belly. And he's think and actually, if you look at the one in the front, that's a pregnant female. So you can see the really fat belly on that. So you're absolutely right. We have a male and a female side by side. And we have an even more stunning picture of a, a beautiful male in the front of this one, just to show you. They, so you can tell that Laurel and I both love bummy chucks. <laughs> They're really cute, cute little species. Okay, you guys did a great job. Um, everybody. Um, so I have to show you this amazing video of a mummy chug because they are so tolerant um, and they are so special. There was a study done um, by a Cornell student that looked at, he first saw this phenomena that these mummy chugs were, um, that were outside of their water bodies, they could pop themselves up on their fin, find the next water source and jump right into that next water source. Um, so I'm gonna play that again, just so you guys all have a chance to see. It's so amazing. Their eyes can actually identify the shininess of the water, so that reflectivity from the sun. Um, and then they just use their tails to kind of pop up, take a look around, find the water, and then fly right into that next water body. So they're pretty amazing fish. Okay, so. We just learned all about the three different types of mummy chugs, or the three different types of killifish, I'm sorry, talking a lot about mummy chugs. Um, and now we're thinking about these different fish in our investigation. So remember, we're trying to figure out whether the Hudson is a river or an estuary, and we're gonna first start by using these, using the biology we just talked about. So I'm going to have you guys first look at this graph. Let's orient ourselves real quick. So the y-axis is the number of fish or fish abundance. Um, the x-axis is looking at river miles. So remember that term that Margie mentioned at the very beginning. Um, the river mile zero starts right there um, at like the tip of Manhattan. So we call that the, the Hudson, the start of the Hudson Harbor. Um, we're increasing in river miles as we go north right here on the compass row. So we're going north and it increases in river mile all the way up to Albany or technically Troy. Um, and then if you see anything that's negative river miles, that's technically outside of the main stem Hudson. So it's that harbor, but it absolutely still has that Hudson influence um, because it's connected. So we have in this map all the way down to river mile negative 11. Okay, so you guys can see that this X axis is pretty well um, aligned with the map here just for orientation purposes. Okay, so first let's look at the striped killifish. These guys are identified as yellow triangles. During this year of 2015, we only found three sites in the Hudson um, that have caught striped killifish. So you guys can see these three points um, varying in the amount of fish that they caught, which is that y-axis. The next fish is the mummy chug. So these are the blue squares. And you guys can see, uh, just like the striped killifish, different sites caught different amounts. Some caught a lot, some caught not as many. 
Um, and the range of where they caught them in the river, if you look at the map, is a little bit different than the striped. So that's interesting. That might say something different about the mummy chug versus the striped. And then the banded are these green circles. So you guys can see um, the green circles. A lot of different sites caught these banded. Um, a lot of sites caught a couple, and then a few sites caught a lot of these banded killifish. And the range in the river miles is quite extensive. So on your piece of paper, I want you guys to estimate what the range was for the striped killifish. So what the river mile range is from the lowest river mile to the highest river mile where they caught these fish. Do the same for the mummy chug. So where is that, that river mile range for the mummy chug? And do the same for the banded. Write down what you guys think. And as you're doing that, as you're really looking, digging deep into this uh, graph, I want you guys to write quickly in the chat, um, what were some of the sites, just make an estimate, where they caught the most fish of all the species? So we'll see what people come up with. Um, just on this map, this is the first time we're seeing this one. So um, the three big cities that were on the initial map, so it was New York City, Manhattan, Poughkeepsie, and Albany, all the way up here. Um, and then we just wanted to name a couple cities in between. So you guys are pretty local to the Hudson, so you might be familiar with these. And then we have the New Jersey, New York border here. And that's Piermont, that's where we fish. All right, okay. did anyone? Great. Well, while we wait for the answers, um, I'm going to ask, um, there's two questions about killifish that, that have come up. Um, so how long, do you know how long uh, killifish uh, live for approximately? And is there a certain type of water that they really enjoy, like salty or fresh? Ah, yes. So that is something that we are going to dive into um, because killifish are all different. Um, and so that's something we'll be looking into. And then the years, um, if you guys can think back when we were looking at the sizes of the fish, um, it ranges from two years, I think was the banded and then up to, was it six years for the stripes? So they don't live very long, um, but they do vary from species to species and that striped killifish was a little bit bigger. So um, they live a little bit longer as well. All right. So I think so, the, the, Laurel, can you repeat your original question? Just so I, I have it in the context of uh, taking the answers and sharing the answers. Sure. So I just wanted them to write down on their piece of paper what the ranges are, the river mile ranges for each one of these species. And then in the chat, I just wanted them to identify what river miles caught the most fish. So it seems like, uh, sorry, there's an out. Um, so it looks like 10 to 20 striped, 10 to 100 uh, mama chogs, and 15 to 153 banded. Perfect. That's, um, I would just extend the striped down to Negative 10? Did they say negative 10? Sorry, what? negative 10. They did say negative 10. <laughs> okay, awesome. That's a perfect range. So these are all estimates, but you guys can see that they're all pretty distinctly in these um, habitat tolerance ranges or preferences. So you guys pretty much found exactly what I had. So just looking at it in a little bit of an easier format, you guys can see that the range of the striped is pretty narrow um, and it's um, isolated to these lower river mile regions where the banded is much, much longer extending for the farthest or the, um, the largest range of all three fish. And then the mummy trick are kind of somewhere in between. So why do you think um, these fish were found in different areas of the Hudson? What would determine why any species would prefer to live in one place over another place? You guys can write that in the chat. Quickly. Um, Laurel, do you think we can come back to this? Um, once, sure. um, people, oh, we have, sorry, we have a couple of answers here. Um, lots of different answers, actually. Um, oh. For 
there's food reasons. Um, some fish striped like the saltwater, salinity, mating, fewer predators. Those are just the, the reasons for why we think uh, Amazing. there's fish in many different areas. Great, great job. I think you hit on a lot of the ones that I was hoping for. Um, so one thing in terms of, it kind of encompasses a lot of the things you guys said. So food and mating and um, protection from predators, that is like a habitat preference. In these sites in the Hudson, they have different habitats. Um, and these different species of killie, they all prefer different, of, different habitats. So um, for example, Canarsie Pier, if you guys have ever been down there, um, it is this, pretty big sandy beach. So maybe there's some large rocks, but mostly it's a sandy bottom. And so um, some species of killi prefer the sandy bottom uh, type habitat. You guys can also notice that Canarsie Pier is located in Jamaica Bay. It has this nice protection from that barrier um, strip of land there. So it creates a very still environment. Um, Remember we talked about that the mummy chucks, they really like to be close to shore. They like to be in that quiet water area. And so um, you're gonna notice that all the sites that we're looking at have that nice, quiet, protected um, water body region. Another site that we find a lot of killies is Inwood. So Inwood is this amazing site where the Harlem River merges with the Hudson. Um, and as you can see behind this young lady who's collecting a lot of killies, or er, yep, killies right out of her fish trap there you see this marsh grass. So it tells you that this site is extremely marshy. And when I think of marshes, I think of lots of mud, lots of sediment. So that is going to be um, primarily what the bottom of this area is going to be like. Muddy, marshy. Piermont Pier, this is our site. Um, again, this is a nice protected area. If you remember from the Google Earth video, it's protected by that pier. Um, so this is fishing on the north side. And if you look behind these ladies with the same net, you can see there's also um, Phragmites, which is a type of marsh grass. So that tells you that this area has um, some mucky, muddy bottoms as well. We're also close to the Pyramont Marsh um, that we talked about earlier. So definitely has an influence on the biology that we catch. Dennings Point, this is also a protected area. So um, the point of Dennings is like a peninsula and it protects this water area right here. And so this is different from uh, the last two sites we talked about, more similar to the Canarsie Sandy type of beach. Uh, maybe uh, there's some like larger trees, shrubbery that's like a little bit upland, but mostly it's just sandy along here. And then our last thing I wanted to talk about was Coxsackie. And Coxsackie, again, it's nice, still, quiet waters with this sandy, maybe small, rocky beach. Um, but it's definitely not a marshy area. So we're ranging in habitats here. Um, all different sites on the Hudson have different habitats, and that can determine what type of killies we catch. So I want you to keep, think about where the different species landed in terms of some of the sites that we talked about. And just keep that in mind as we keep talking through our investigation, because that probably plays a role in why we find some fish in some areas and not others. Okay, so we're back to our estuary and river concepts. And um, we, Laurel just did a wonderful job of taking you from some, through some of these varied habitats. And so now let's just kind of look through these and see, have we tackled or addressed any of these concepts that might lend us to think that one is more what we're looking at than the other? Um, so we have looked at habitats. And so if you wanna look down your list, you'll see close to the bottom, we have highly complex with varied habitats versus less complex. So we just looked at a variety of different habitats, which suggests to me, hmm, maybe we're leaning a little towards estuary. And then further down, um, there's people rely on them for many things they provide. We did talk a little bit about that when we looked at our movie and we saw the fact that there were different, there was a quarry there, there was an industrial use, and we have all these wonderful fish, the nursery. So I think that we have addressed that one as well. Again, though, that's in both estuary and river. So maybe we need to keep moving. So why don't we move to our next part of the investigation? And in this part of the investigation, we're going to look at salinity in different parts of the Hudson. And we've talked about the fact that um, there are 
connections at one part of our river or our estuary, whichever we're going to find out, um, to the Atlantic Ocean. And the Atlantic Ocean has some salt in it. So we're going to expect that that salt might be something we want to look for. Maybe it doesn't make it in at all. Maybe it does. Let's do an investigation and find out. And to do that, we have different students shown here and they have different tools. So on the left, you'll see um, a hydrometer, which measure salt by looking at the water density. So you can see the little white arm on that hydrometer is floating part way up, which tells me there must be some salt in the water that she's looking at. In the middle, you see a student that looks as if they're holding something like a telescope or a pirate a scope, and that's called a refractometer. It works on light. And so if there's salt in there, the light will bounce off or refract off the salt crystals. So that's the second tool you can use. And the third tool is called a Quantab. And that's the, there's a little bit of chloride that runs up that strip. And chloride is a big part of actually salt, our NaCl. And so um, if there is salt in that water, it will wick its way up and that brown will turn white. So those are our tools. Let's get into our investigation. Okay, so we are looking at um, some salt measurements that were taken by students in the Hudson. And again, as Laurel mentioned with our last graph that we looked at, the x-axis is river miles. So we started way down below um, the tip of the battery down at river mile 10 and beyond, beyond actually for some of our measurements. And then they move all the way up to Albany and Troy, which is river mile 153. And then for this particular graph on the y-axis, we're actually looking at salinity in parts per million. So just to get oriented, the ocean is 35,000 parts per million. Now you don't see 35,000 parts per million on this particular graph. And that's because nobody was sampling right out in the ocean. But you see that we do have some points that are pretty salty. So we're close so let's just for orientation each one of these little lines is a thousand so thirty thousand is the top line the next would be twenty nine thousand twenty eight thousand so our first measurement is twenty seven thousand parts per million of salinity and as you look at this graph you'll see that it varies all the way from that a lot of salt to pretty much almost nothing on the bottom line. So again, if you look up at the key, you'll see that we consider marine water anything that's 18,000 parts per million or more. Brackish, which is that mix of salt and fresh, is between 18,000 parts per million and all the way down to 100 parts per million. And then for us, we consider fresh to be about 100 parts per million. So on your paper, let's just write down, where do you find the most salt? Where did we find the least salt when our students were out sampling? So was it in the negative numbers or in the up at 150 that you found fresh or salt? Um, and the next thing that I want you to think about is looking at this particular graph, which part of the river looks as if it's the largest? Does it look as if our marine, if we were using 18,000 parts per million as our divide, or our brackish, or our fresh would be the largest part of our system? And I want you to write that down on your piece of paper. And then lastly, we're going to take this big question that says, why do you think it varies? Why do you think it's not all the same salinity or not? all exactly the same. And remember, in a river we have more consistency than in an estuary. So this is an important part of our investigation. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide where we're going to look at some very specific measurements. So for this slide, we actually tried to pull some of the measurements on for you to make it a little easier to look at. So you can see that at about river mile negative nine, we had 27,000 parts per million. Remember that was our, our most salty section. So again, thinking about it, where was the most salt? Well, it was going to put us closer to the ocean. 
So not too surprising. And if you travel up the river, we go from very salty to all of a sudden we drop from 10,000 parts per million to less than 1,000 parts per million to 988 at around river mile 50. And then remember that break is at 100 parts per million. We don't have anywhere that had a sample of 100 parts per million, but we can assume it was in between this 266 and 70 part per million area. 70 at around Poughkeepsie and our 266 at around Newburgh. So somewhere in between there is where we went to what we would consider fresh. So if we were to take our pencils and draw a line across just the way Laurel did last time, um, which do you think again is the largest part? Would it be our marine, our brackish, or our fresh? And we're just gonna have Laurel pop up those markers and you'll see that the fresh is by far the largest part. The brackish is next. And then what we would consider marine is really only very much down at the tip, down in the Manhattan and the Harbor area. That's where we see the biggest salty influence. So why do you think the salinity changes in different parts of the Hudson? Well, if you think about it, we have the ocean giving us a salty push at the bottom, and that's tidal, so it's pushing it in with a high tide and pulling it back with a low tide. But remember that whole watershed image that we showed you where all this fresh water was coming into the Hudson drainage from the higher peaks and all our little streams and tributaries, and that was a pretty big watershed. So there is a lot of fresh water that's also entering the system and pushing on down. I think I'm gonna take the second to answer one of the questions that's come up several times, and that is, where does the Hudson change from being an estuary to being a river? And some people might wanna say, well, maybe that's where it changes to being fresh, but in fact, that's not true we still have this wonderful effect of the tides that goes all the way up to Troy. And the reason that it stops at Troy is because there's a change in elevation there. And so the tide just can't push up higher. Now we have a dam there, but before we had a dam, we still had an elevation change. So that is the end of what we would think of as the section that's influenced by our um, ocean system. And so we'll go to our next slide and we'll let Laurel kind of look through how these pieces tie together. All right, great job everybody. So we just looked at two um, key components of the Hudson. We looked at the biology and we looked at the salt. And so here I popped up all the data that we just looked at. Um, so we have the three different species that we really focused on, the striped, the mummy, and the banded, um, in comparison to this, uh, the different salinity that we just marked out for the Hudson. So I want you guys to um, answer in the chat if you can. Go ahead and tell me, um, can you say anything about the preferences of the striped killifish, of all the things we talked about? What about the mummy chug? What about the banded? Um, and if this is a little bit complex for everyone to look at all at once, think about um, this is all of the um, salinity concentration that we just talked about all in one line and go species by species. So look at the striped and compare it to the salinity and maybe the mummy and then maybe the banded and then think back to the habitats that we talked about and then maybe jot some notes down. Um, I would love to hear from you guys what you guys think because this is gonna hopefully give us our answer to our investigation. And while we wait for that, Laurel, um, there's a question um, that came in while Margie was talking about um, the, uh, I think around the Troy area. So the question was, how deep would the tide go if there weren't a Hudson River? So um, at, I'll, I'll just pop in and answer that. So the tidal, how deep would it go or how far would it go? 
I, I'm not sure I understand that question, but I, what I can say is that the tidal range between low and high tide is at a, about five feet at the Troy Dam, which is actually larger than it is um, further down by us in the river. And that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. It's because the river gets very narrow. Remember I said the river is wide by us. And so as that river narrows, it forces the same amount of water into a narrower section. And so it forces that um, tidal uh, reach to be just a little bit larger. How far would it go if we didn't have um, the difference in elevation, if that was the question? I guess we don't know. There are lots of elevation differences as you get beyond the Troy Dam. There are a whole series of dams that go up. So it feels as if it would have petered out pretty quickly. Uh, it was, sorry, Margie, the, the person who asked the question clarified was how far up the riverbed, I believe was. Would it go if yep. there wasn't a dam? Or if there wasn't, I believe if, it, if there wasn't a dam or if there wasn't a Hudson? I'm not sure what the, if there wasn't a Hudson, but if there, okay. if, there wasn't, if there wasn't, let's go with if there wasn't a dam. And I think it's just, it would go until it hit a, a significant elevation difference. And that happens pretty quickly after Troy, there are a whole series right in a row. It's mm -hmm. a great question. Great, thank right. you. Um, and so Laurel, the answers that have come in, um, so it looks like the Mummachogs at the 97 mark seemed like a bit of an outlier, um, striped like marine, um, Mummachogs like brackish and fresh, and the, the banded like uh, brackish and fresh. Great job. Um, I agree. And I think if we start looking at the striped, um, it's pretty clear that they've just really liked that salt. Um, and the mummy chugs, uh, yes, they can tolerate. Remember, they are extremely tolerant fish. They're tolerant to low oxygen. They're tolerant to a wide range of salinity. Um, one thing that mummy chug, and you would kind of have to really pull it back to when we talked about habitats, is they really love marshy environments. So they are very tolerant of salt. They just want to find that nice, muddy, marshy environment. Remember, they're called mud minnows. So um, they, they are uh, they're lovers of the marsh. Um, and then banded, they are typically thought of as our more freshwater killi. Um, but as you guys can see, that they are tolerant of the brackish as well. So I think there is something uh, to think about is that these fish, they have preferences, um, but they are their tolerance ranges are much wider than their preferences that they have. Um, so that's just something to think about if you're ever fishing and you find a anomalous fish um, in a weird area that you wouldn't expect. Um, it, it might just be because that they have a larger tolerance range than their preferences. Great job, everyone. So I just wanna pop back to our final um, estuary versus river debate. So we already hit on two that um, through our investigation so far, we already know that there are um, highly complex varied uh, habitats. So that's leaning us toward estuaries. Um, people rely on them, but they rely on rivers, of course, as well. So that doesn't help us too much. But what we just talked about is that um, our Hudson connects to the ocean, which brings in that salty influence. So we do have a marine, a brackish, and a fresh section. Um, and because we are connected to the ocean, it makes our environment so dynamic. It makes um, the salinity dynamic, the tides are dynamic, the biology, it just, um, it's a very dynamic system. Whereas uh, a river, if it wasn't um, connected to the ocean, things can be pretty consistent. Um, and the last is that we have these species of fresh salt and brackish um, in the Hudson. And so depending on where you're fishing, you're going to find different types of species. And that's what makes it so fun when we do day in the life because we have hundreds of sites, hundreds of schools that are sampling up and down the Hudson and the um, species or the animals that people catch right in New York City are so different in comparison to the schools that fish up in the um, near like Albany area. So um, it's fun when we get to share our data at the end. All right. So 
I think all arrows point to estuaries. So good job, guys. Um, and that's why a lot of people, they call it the Hudson River Estuary. Um, because we have that, that river portion above the Troy Dam and then it, right from the Troy Dam all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean. It, it's that nice um, dynamic estuary system. So we are very lucky to be so close to this amazing ecosystem. If you guys want to explore more about the Hudson, um, feel free to check out our Day in the Life on the Hudson website. Uh, the link is right here below. Um, it has all the data. Um, there's a long-term history of data collected by students, so you can really do a deep data dive. Uh, Margie and I love data, so that's one of our <laughs> pastimes. We also have a lot of other activities if you guys wanted to learn more about um, the Hudson and whether it's an estuary. Some of the two that we didn't hit on today is that it flows both ways or that the depth is determined by tides. Those are things that you can um, easily investigate on your own. Um, we just don't, didn't have time today, but if you want to explore those, you can on this website. There are some activities for you. Um, and I also encourage you to check out our Hudson River Field Station website. Um, right here is the link. We are going to be um, uploading and posting educational videos, um, resources, lessons. So feel free to check it out throughout the summer. We're gonna continuously be adding new things. Um, we also have an Instagram. If you have Instagram, you can follow us at LDEO underscore field station. If you don't have an Instagram, that's absolutely fine. You can go to our website and we post the exact same pictures with the informational blurbs. Um, it's linked right on our website. So you can check that out there as well. We would love to see you guys um, in the future. If you are in the local area and you have a chance to stop at Piermont, um, hopefully next summer, uh, we can see you guys. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to get one last question in here before we uh, departed that I did not get to. Um, so there was a question about whether or not killifish crossbreed with other killifish or other types of fish. Um, and have you ever tested any of this crossbreeding um, at, the, at the field station? That's a great question. Uh, we don't do any testing of killifish at the field station. Um, we are catch and release. Margie, do you know, have you heard of any um, killifish testing to see if they crossbreed? I, I have not. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I really couldn't even answer that, to be honest. It's an interesting thought um, because they do share habitats. So we certainly catch both banded and mummichug at Piermont. Um, we have never pulled any stripe. We're not that salty. But whether they would actually cross with each other, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and there's a question about when the field station might be open to students, which is yeah. a tough question to answer in the current circumstances. <laughs> you know, our hearts are down there every day. We really wish that we could say it's going to be soon, but um, our expectation is that uh, it probably won't be open for uh, a month or even throughout the summer. We're working on it. We're trying to be safe. And um, so that's why, as Laurel mentioned, we're trying to do videos and we'll be trying to really reach out with some fun things through our web page to be able to engage you and show you around. Um, but we want you to be safe. So that's our first priority. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you to everyone who stuck around uh, for the for the session today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sending around a recording um, and we'll make sure to include all of these links as well that Laurel has shared so that you can keep um, stay stay tuned with the field station information um, as what as well as when um, the station might be open um, and also if you're interested in joining uh, and participating in the day in the life of the Hudson River event. Um, Laurel and Margie, any uh, final messages you want to share with our viewers? Enjoy your water. So you know everyone <laughs> has a water address so let's make sure we protect it and enjoy it. So explore. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in for another EI Live K-12 session. So that brings um, our May session to an end, and we have an additional month of sessions on Mondays and Wednesdays. And Laurel and Margie will actually be back later in June to do a sea level rise um, session as well. And Laurel will also be doing a session on glacier goo um, and making glacier goo. 
Um, so if you have any questions about those sessions or if you'd like to um, check out what the other sessions are, uh, please email me directly. Um, and again, we'll share a recording to this uh, video in a couple of days. Um, Margie and Laurel, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this. And um, I really learned a lot. I love listening in on these and, and learning at the same time. Uh, thank you to our viewers and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.